for about 18 years. I've been living out in Chenega Bay. I moved into Cordova on November this year, <coughs> last year. Uh, so predominantly this work um, is focused in Chenega Bay. There are, and we'll talk um, about how I'm expanding the project. Uh, so it, originally, the project originally started off as the Chenega Bay Hummingbird Banding Project. I'm now an official 501c3. Oh, my went wrong way. And I have my federal master class banding permit. I think I am 118 master class hummingbird banders in the nation. Somewhere. So I'm the only one that runs a full-time hummingbird banding station in Alaska. It's the farthest northern hummingbird banding station in the world. And we're getting some incredible uh, information. So we're going to start off most talking about this bird right here, which is a rufous hummingbird. And this is a female. She has a little orange dot on her head, so that's not indicative of the bird. That's I put that there. We'll discuss that why. Um, so first, let's talk about what do we know about rufous hummingbirds. We actually don't know a whole lot about them. The rufous hummingbird, this is the farthest northern extent of the breeding range, the north gulf coast of Alaska. Uh, they are known to be um, very uh, cold tolerant, uh, extremist wanderers. Uh, not much more than that is known about them. We do know a little bit uh, about uh, their cognitive abilities, uh, and we know uh, that their flight dynamics and physiological capabilities are quite remarkable. As a matter of fact, if it wasn't for studying hummingbird and vocally flight, we wouldn't know about drone technology. They even made one looks like hummingbird. So, uh, it's been pretty exciting learning about hummingbirds in uh, Alaska and what they do up here. Uh, and uh, the federal uh, hummingbird people at the USGS uh, Bird Banding Laboratory are very excited about it as well. Um, so first let's talk about what we think we know about their life history. Um, these are two little babies you see here. Uh, they're just about ready to fledge. And do you see the flies? It gives you some size comparison. Okay. So the nests are built with moss and uh, spider webs and lichen and bark. And the female will lay two eggs. Uh, and she incubates them for a little over 14 days. And the young become independent after about 21 days. And they feed a lot on nectar, as we know, but also on small insects. Hummingbirds are part of the uh, flycatcher family, and they eat quite a bit of insects, especially when they first show up in the spring. Uh, as you know, there might be a lot of snow still on the ground. There might not be a whole lot of bloom going on, but the alders and the willows will be budding and get that sweet, sappy scent in the air. And who bugs are attracted to that? the buds on um, the alders and the willows, and you'll see hummingbirds going and actually gnat picking spiders and gnats and other small bugs off those buds. And they'll also gnat catch in the air, just like a flycatcher will. Yep. So. And they're also capable of topor for short periods of time, which makes them why they're so cold tolerant. Topor is a short period of hibernation. So that temperature goes down below freezing at night, the bird can just slow that heart rate right down and basically hibernate overnight until the warm temperatures come up again in the morning, flowers open up, and the wings up, and off they go. So on an average year, there's a whole bunch of males coming into the feeder right before evening. The males will arrive the last week of April, first week of May, in the South Central and Prince William South. The females will show up ten, seven to ten days later. So while, the, while they're waiting for the girls to show up, of course, they're fighting, looking for their territory, staking it out. Right? And then, usually, we have a salmonberry bloom right about the beginning of May. And there's so much bloom going on, so many insects out there, that they're not really feeding very heavily on the feeders at all unless we have a severe weather event. So they'll kind of disappear from the feeders, but they're still here. They're incubating their eggs. And believe it or not, the males leave by the end of June. They're here barely two months. They just say, that was great, ladies. We're heading south. Raise the babies. We'll see you down there. <laughs> okay. So the mid-June, the females are back on the feeders. And the fledglings begin to show up by July. And then by the first week of August, for all intents and purposes, they're gone. There might be a few lingering here and there. There's some you know, question as to why, why they're lingering. Are they too stupid? They're not quite ready to migrate. Something might not be 
write with them. Well, you know, maybe they will just like it here. They don't need to leave. So Norma Snowyo, this is uh, the house in Shinigo where I did most of my banding for the past seven years. You can see that there is snow on the ground. And I've perched my ladder on it. And I've got a trap around the feeder there. Okay. But then you have record snow years, like you know, so, snow apocalypse. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. There's a hummingbird. See him? And this is a greenhouse <coughs> that's 10 feet tall. <laughs> so that's how much snow was here. And the hummingbird showed up and said, thank God she's got that feeder. Right there. So there's another look at it. There's the feeder right there. Very. And then we have years like 2014. Same week, and we've got a full fairy bloom going on. Wow. So what we've learned right off the bat is how much snow we have at end of April is going to tell us when the hummingbirds are going to show up, and how many will show up. Um, after snow apocalypse year, we had such a late, heavy snow load on top of the berry bushes, it really depressed the bloom. So most of the birds just they went elsewhere. There just wasn't enough here for them. So why do we ban? Well, we would like to know how many are there. That's a really good question. We don't really know. And where are they going? How many are surviving? And how do these populations change over time? Especially since we're talking about global climate change. It's really skewing uh, where these birds are going and how they're going. So first, let's talk about where I've been banding. Guys, most of you guys are pretty familiar with Prince William Sound. So from 2007 to 15, uh, the, First banding station established here on Shinega, Evans Island. Okay, and then 2013, I came out here to Cordova and, bought, and banded at Tony Perry's house at Orca Lodge. That was surprisingly um, successful that year. Uh, I came back in 2014 to try again, and that was the year that the birds like just weren't cute. And I sat and stared at that feeder at that lodge for a long time and. Didn't do anything. But then uh, last year I went out to Port Ashton Lodge, which is at the base of the bay uh, on Evans Island. Still, still right in here. We ended there. And then at Eyak Lake here in Cordova this spring. Um, that was really successful. I really would like to get back there again this spring. So, how do you catch a hummingbird? And they can be tricky, okay, especially when they refuse to go in the trap. So I have a couple of different traps, and I have a uh, long experience and training from wily people than myself. And Dave, do you recognize that picture? Dave Jenkins. Thanks for the credit. Oh, one more So then what do we do with them once we catch them? So we take a lot of different measurements. See, I'm holding a bird right there. She's not very happy at me. They curse me quite regularly. So first, let's talk about how big is the bed. Where's my trusty assistant? Yes, please. And he's going to walk around and show you. OK, so show you go walk on OK, so if you are banding ducks, whoops. I'm going way. Okay. If you're lucky and you get to go band ducks, you get a great big huge band like this, already comes formed and made from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and you get to put it on its leg, no problem, off you go. If you're going to ban hummingbirds, it's a whole different playbook. Not only do the band sizes change from species to species in hummingbirds, but they also change from sex between hummingbirds. And when you are banding babies, you've got to be really certain that you've got the right species and sex. Otherwise, you could put the wrong size band on the bird, and you don't want to do that. If it's too large, obviously it's going to fall off. If it's too tight, that's even a worse scenario. We don't want to damage the bird. That's number one. You do not want to harm the, the bird. So, you, uh, uh, Bird Banding Laboratory sends me the bands that come in a strip like this. So this is a strip of 10 bands. Each one has a unique number identifying it. And then I shape it according to the size that I need for that species. And this is a clip of 100 bands ready to go. A band weighs less than 2% of a bird's total body weight. It's equivalent to a 200 pound man wearing a light wristwatch. So it doesn't really bother them weight-wise. It doesn't put them any, any problems that way. 
And then when they're flying, they tuck their feet up into their feathers. And so that it's not causing any kind of drag either. So the birds are not bothered by the band at all. And we always inspect the band before we release the bird to ensure that the band is fitting correctly and adequately on the band, on the bird. If there is any doubt whatsoever, the band is renewed. And then we, we, catch, we recapture quite a few of birds that we've banded from year to year. And we always re-inspect that band. And if for some reason the band is damaged or whatever, well, that bird has served her her scientific duty. She gets the band removed and she does not get a new one put on. She can go and go on her way. So, what kind of measurements are we taking? Well, we like to see how long their bill lengths are. As a matter of fact, one of the interesting things we've discovered is that female rufous hummingbirds have longer colon or beak lengths than male hummingbirds. And I am a fervent believer this is pure self-defense. <laughs> because those males can be incredibly persistent, as you boys know that you can be. And sometimes that female just needs to say, go away. Okay. So we also take their weight, and I weigh them. This is on actually an, an old gunpowder weighing scale that my that was my husband's. He subsequently took them out away from me, which I have another scale to weigh. But that's 3.82 grams for that female rufus. That's basically three large paper clips, and that's that's about an average weight. When she gets ready to migrate, she might weigh about 4.1, 4.3. She's really got the pounds on. She's ready to go. So they'll just lay on their back. And just, you can see my hand is just barely cupped over her. So they'll do like play possum for just a second, you know, that little cat defense mechanism, you know. So if I can just lay her just for a second, get, get that weight, and then take her back off. But some of the other species of birds you cannot do that with, and we have to weigh them in a bag. Yeah, they just, they You can see I have a net bag right here for, for holding them. Okay. And then we check uh, the wing length, central tail length, the general condition of the bird, and, no. and it, how much it weighs. So when we're talking about immature ID, it can be very challenging to um, identify these little guys. So this is a picture Tony Perry sent me last year. She took some great pictures. This is, it's a shame she's not here tonight. Um, you'll see quite a few pictures of her. So some more pictures. You can see his little band right there. Normally you can't do that. That's just like, and then you can like make out a number on it. It's like even better. But most cases that stuff can happen. So, but you can tell he looks kind of fun. And his feathers have a little bit of rufous edging. So that, that's one way you can kind of get that gestalt, that that's a baby you're looking at rather than an adult female. Okay. Then the second thing we look at when the bird is in the hand, and this is, this is distinguishable, this is number one, you can look at the gorget patterns and you might say, yeah, that looks like a baby, but what you need to look at is the Coleman corrugations. The Coleman is the beak. So when the bird is an immature bird, if you look at the bill, through a magnifying glass, it actually looks like somebody's taken a file and rasped it down the length of the bill. So you can see the striations, corrugations, going down the length of the beak. And as the bird matures, those striations smooth out. So you can actually get a really good age indicative, indicator of if it's 80% of that bill is covered, that's, a, that's an immature bird born this year. If it's 10%, that's an adult bird. So that's, that's, that's a real good indicator mark. And then we also need to look, is it a boy or is it a girl? So for that, on rufuses, and these, these different ID points change from species, so we're just talking rufus here, this would work for other, other species. Uh, we look at the tail pattern here and the color. There's rufus, there's a little bit of black and green. That's a male. You can see I have a, I have a cheat sheet so I make sure I don't beat it backwards because I do that a lot. Uh, the females will be rufous, green, black, in a much more even pattern. So between checking the colon corrugations and then the tail pattern markings, I can say, okay, this is an immature male, and this is the right size band. Okay, so now we get to the good stuff, the data. There's a, there's a male, you can tell he's very angry at me, especially since I gave him this orange dot. Thank you. 
using that look. So, we started the project in 2007, so that was an incomplete data year. We didn't start banding birds till after the males had already left, so that's why we had no after hatch year males, which is, uh, we can't say how old a bird is. Once we know it's an adult, we can, only, we can only say this bird is at least one year old or an after hatch year bird. Okay, so that's what that means, whoops. Uh, after hatch year females, and then hatch year males and hatch year females are the young of the year. So 20, 2007 was the first year that we were banding, so we had incomplete numbers. And then 2012 is snow ap apocalypse year, which really depressed um, the adults coming in and nesting. And then we had our early spring last year, which was pretty, uh, or and in 2014, and those were pretty good breeding years. So you can see um, we've banded almost 2,500 birds. <coughs> So this is all captures, this is bands, plus birds that we banded, plus recaptures, birds that we've banded in previous years that have re subsequently returned and we've recaptured again. And this is really important numbers. And what is amazing is the site fidelity of these birds. They know exactly where your feeder is. They know exactly where that columbine plant is and they will return to the exact same spot every year and they'll bring their babies with them and teach them. And if you move that feeder, they'll let you know. They go, wait a minute, it was over here. I know you have it here now, but it was over here. You guys have been hanging feeders for a while. You know this is true. Okay? So most band and recapture or mark and recapture scientific projects um, with with birds in particular, correct me if I'm wrong, your uh, recapture, percent recapture rate is usually around 9%. We're getting 18 to 20% recapture. Now, one of the reasons for that is because we are catching birds at the terminus point of their migration. So the, the birds are, you know, I might be catching some birds here who might be moving on over to the western side of the sound, maybe spilling over into Kenai, but for the most part, they come to Prince William Sound and they're stopping. So that's where I'm getting them. Other projects, such as mine, are catching them in between. So that gives them less likelihood of recapturing that same bird from year to year. Because as they're going from point A to point B, they may not be going along the exact same spots from year to year to get from point A to point B. And that's one of the reasons why our project is so important, because we're helping answer those linkages questions. So where are they going? Well, according to the knowledge that be, uh, Rufus hummingbirds are predominantly Pacific Coast birds that go from the North Gulf Coast of Alaska to Central America. However, Rufus say just because you wrote it in a book doesn't mean that that's necessarily true. We know that they're vagrants, they're wanderers. They can be found in weird places at weird times. These are babies that were found, stopped off of, onto a fishing boat to get a bit of drink of water. Uh, and they're 50 miles off of uh, Vancouver, 50, yeah, 50 miles south of Vancouver Island, 52 miles out to sea, off of New Flattery. Could have been my ba big babies, I can't tell, I can't see the new band. Could have been my baby. So, since the 19, late 80s and 90s, um, there has been a great cadre of hummingbird banders in the southeastern United States who have been documenting rufuses uh, on the East Coast. Are they here? Uh, were they always here? Is it a new thing that they've established? Um, what's going on here is still the question. Um, I'm originally from Georgia and Florida. I moved to Alaska in 1998. You can stay there then. And this area in the 70s and 80s went through a huge implosion of subdivision and strip malls and gardens and everybody put hummingbird feeders up and planted azaleas and dogwoods and everybody started uh, looking at hummingbirds. So the question is, was this something that was new and the hummingbirds started taking advantage of this new habitat? Because, you know, why fly all the way across the Gulf of Mexico and go to Mexico where there's all this habitat destruction going on and drought and fires and everything else? Um, 
Or is this something that's happened because of climate change? Uh, so that's another question that we're asking. And how are they going? It's another really big question. So let's look at some previous long distance data. And this is not my data. This is previous data before my work came along. So the longest uh, recapture from a Rufus hummingbird was a bird that went from Louisiana, British Columbia, and then they got another one in the exact opposite direction from British Columbia to Alabama, and that was like, oh, so I guess there is a link to the southeastern United States. And then, this is where the fun stuff comes. Um, I throw my needles out there into the haystack and hope somebody somewhere along the line will find one. Right? And that doesn't always happen. And But uh, we all, the bird banders out there, are hopeful creatures. And we don't always like to wait for the USGS to get around to telling us <laughs> what, what's happening. So we all have an uh, email listserv. And we exchange data and notes and health and all. But we also go, hey, I just caught E56293. Whose bird is it? And then everybody goes to their files. It's mine. Bingo. So this is one of the first recaptures that we caught here in Shenandoah. This little girl was banded on January 13, 2010 in Tallahassee, Florida, by one of my heroes, Master Fred, Master Hummingbird, bird, humming band burger. I can't say that. Hummingbird band. There we go. Fred Dietrich. And I caught her that subsequent June here in Chenega. And there she is in his hand, and that's her little data card, how much, how much she weighs. She's 3.7 grams. Uh, she was a second year bird, so she was at least one years old. Okay? And that turned out to be the long distance record for a hummingbird of any species to be captured on either side of its migration route. The very first bird that I captured that had another band on it that wasn't mine. So that's what that looks like. But did she go 3,500 plus miles in a straight line? Probably not. So did she go that way, take a ride at Albuquerque and head up the Pacific Coast? Or perhaps she went up the eastern seaboard and then headed across the Great Lakes and the Rockies? We don't know. Second farmer had. This girl was banded as a hatcher bird in Fort Davis Mountains, Texas, August 27, 2012. And I recaptured her July of the following year, in 2013, as an adult bird. What made this bird so interesting is, remember when they're born, she left, so if she was caught in Texas on August 27, and they leave here by August, that means at less than two months of age, she flew all the way to Texas in less than 30 days. 30 to 45 days. That's pretty incredible. And guess what? She did it again. Ta-da! If she has P0547.3, caught her 2014 again. She's like, yes, hello, I remember you. OK, can I go now? I have babies. So, last year was the first time that birds that I have banded have been recaptured outside of Alaska. That was really exciting. Unfortunately, the bird was found in distress by a rehabilitator. She subsequently died, but at least she was recovered. And this bird was banded in Chenega in 2014, summer 2014, and was found in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, the subsequent August, that following August. So she was out migrating. An adult female. Okay. The second one, E25883, she was banded as an adult in 09 in Chenega. She was one of my early birds. And I recaught her subsequently in 2013 and 2014, and then she was found, unfortunately, dead in Mill Valley, California this spring. She was actually one of my oldest recorded birds. She was like at least eight years old. That's not, a, that's not like a historical record for Rufus's, but it was like one of my oldest you know, like recaptured birds. So that was really interesting. So let's look at that. Um, uh, this map was um, made for me by one of our, um, our Quebec hummingbird friends um, from uh, Project Pilibre, Jacques And so that shows the trajectory. So 
what's really interesting here is like it it looks like we've got birds both going they're they're originating out of Prince William Sound, but some look like they're heading to Mexico and some look like they're heading to southeast Alaska. Um, there's another uh, hummingbird bander who's working down in Tongass National Forest, Gwen Ballas, she works at the Forest Service down there. She's been doing some a little bit of banding for the past couple of years. And she had a, uh, uh, a researcher uh, ask to share some feathers to do radioisotope studies on. And radioisotope studies are really interesting. Uh, what it does is it can take an analysis of fur, feathers, you know, any kind of piece that has DNA in it, I guess. I'm not in that part of science. <laughs> but they can look at actually the pollution signature that's in your hair or a piece of feather. And with birds, they can determine where that bird might have been when it grew that feather by looking at a very specific pollution signature. So Gwen gave some, uh, some feathers of some of the female hummingbirds that she had caught. I think it was like three or four birds. And those birds were coming out of central Mexico. So it could very well be we have like two different populations of rufuses coming into Prince William Sound or Alaska, because she's down in southeast Alaska. So that's one of the questions we're looking at. Another question, one of the reasons I moved to Cordova is I'm looking to catch one of these guys. For the past decade or more, there have been reports of Anna's hummingbirds overwintering in Cordova and Seward, Homer, Kenai. They're not coming to Chenega. You're not seeing them out there in Chenega, but they're here. Uh, this was a uh, picture taken in 2010 of an adult female. This is in October uh, in Seward. This is a male that was taken this spring in Seward. This is the first photo documentation I've seen of a spring Anna's male. Annas are listed as rare in uh, Alaska, very rare in South Central. To my knowledge, an Annas has never been banded in South Central Alaska. Um, we were trying to figure out where these females and immatures were coming from in the late fall. Uh, they're high altitude nesters. Uh, are they just straying into you know, South Central Alaska from the Kenai Mountains or something? We, we just weren't sure. But now with, with this guy, I, I have to say, it's pretty indicative to me that we've got an, a breeding population of Annas expanding into, into South Central Alaska. So that's one of my project goals, is to document that. Get some bands on these guys, see how many are actually here, and uh, start following them around. So where's the closest known breeding area? I mean, on the, where's their range right now? They're, they're listed as occasional in South East. Alaska, but like are they breeding down in Vancouver? Yeah, Oregon, like California, BC? Oregon, Washington. I think to BC too, or then? Yeah, I think I think they will go up into BC. Uh, they're pretty cold tolerant species, so uh, I'm hoping that we'll have I'll get to use. Uh, I've got I've been very optimistic. I've, I've made, as you saw, I made two different size bands here. The six point are for the Annas. They're ready to go, just like this little girl is ready to go. She's got her band and her dots. Hopefully she'll come back and see me again. And if you'd like to follow the project, um, I am an official 501c3 scientific research and education nonprofit now. I don't have a web page. Let's get some money for that. In a bit. But we do have social media, thank goodness. Um, you can keep up with the project on Facebook. And if you'd like to see publications, data, and history, I do have them mounted on my personal web page uh, at Alaska, aka Environmental Services under the publications. And you can look at some articles and some other data that I have there. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Uh, I use a water based paint. I've, I've been using water based white out, but they quit making it. As a matter of fact, I was here in Cordova in May, and I went up to the hardware store. I was looking for something completely different. And they had like two bottles on the shelf. They were all dusty in the back. And I'm like, do you have any more? I'll buy them all. <laughs> and it's just to let you know that you caught them this season? Or? Yes, because they will come right back into my trap. Oh. And like, you, you can't see that band. It's like, I love you, darling. But I don't want to really handle you again until next year. So I put a dot on, on their head 
so I don't catch her again on purpose. But it also helps me do spatial um, studies too, uh, you know, in local territory. Uh, my other baby station at Port Ashton Lodge is roughly three nautical miles from Chinega. So when I band down there and I'm catching birds, I'll put a different color on their head. And then if I see a bird with a white dot, I go, oh, that's the bird. I must have just banded her in Chinega. You know, and then I can put an orange shot and know that I banded that bird at Port Ashton. Or when, if um, my husband used to help me do this project, so I would come to Cordova to band, and he'd be watching the feeders in Chinega. So what we were hoping is he would see a, you know, a bird with an orange dot on its head and go, oh, you know, we'd really like to see it, the trajectory through them and moving through the sound. You know. Any other questions? What is the historic oldest hummingbird based on market capture? I think for a rufus, it's like 10 years old, 10 and a half years old. Yeah. That's really cool. Of course, in captivity, they could live a lot longer. But yeah. for a wild bird, for, for a recovery, I think it's 10. What's the difference between Anna's and Rufus? How do you tell them apart? Okay. Um, Anna's is significantly bigger. Okay, well, take that the wrong way. Okay, so this is a female Rufus. And you can see that she has a lot of Rufus on her sides. And other than that, she's basically green and white. Okay? Now the, oop, I'm going the wrong way again. Okay. So the Anna, you see she's totally green and white. Just almost plain green and white. No Rufus at all. She's going to be a third again larger, significantly larger. And then the male, again, he's going to be significantly larger than the rufous males. And he is green with this magenta gorget. Okay? Whereas the, let's find that male picture. Almost there. Let's go back to the data slide. I should put more, more adult male pictures in here. They're just too pretty. There. You can see how red he is. He's very red. Very rufous red. And then this is mostly an orange, but depending, you know, it's very iridescent. So depending on what way that light is refracting, it can look anything from an orange to a green. Of course, the Annas will flash that magenta purple, but they're significantly bigger. If you're used to seeing Rufus's, you'll see an Anna's and go, that's a honking big hummingbird. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> yeah. What about ruby throats? Uh, you know, Dan Gibson has never verified one in Fairbanks, but people have seen what they got ruby So they said. Do you know anything about their I don't. I what, what about the distribution like, in Florida and Georgia? Well, yeah, that, that's the hummingbird I grew up with. Right. You know? Yeah, right. and they're basically east of the Mississippi, and mm -hmm. is, there, is there range change because yes. habitat changes in Florida and Georgia, for instance? Well, we don't know if it's habitat change or what, but all the ranges of hummingbirds are changing. In, in particular, rufuses, they're, they're known as a species of international concern, um, and, and hummingbirds in particular are great indicator species of environmental health. Um, a lot of the fires and the droughts and things that are happening down in the Midwest are having a really big pressure on the hummingbirds. Uh, they come through to migrate, and that field of flowers that was there is now burned out. They've got to find another place to get groceries. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can be hard to be a hummingbird. And you know, it's, I have to say this, I, I used to study birds of prey. I used to be a falconer. Mm -hmm. Predator birds, talons that eat meat, right? Hummingbirds make raptors look like wimps. They really do. Hummingbirds live on the edge. They're ferocious predators. They take no prisoners. They fight. You watch them on the feeders. They fight each other, and, and they're quite ferocious. Um, so, you know, mighty mites. Uh, when they do their display dives, they actually, uh, I guess you guys aren't familiar with the hummingbird display dive. The male will get up in the air where he can get the sunlight is catching him. He'll make his little warrior call, and he'll do a J dive. And at the end of that dive, pulls up and the he's actually pulling more G's than a fighter pilot can handle and a fighter pilot would pass out on the on the upward swing. And that pressure on the the tips of his primary wing feathers is actually making the noise that you hear that zing. And then he goes back and he does it again. And if he sees the female, the females are really hard to spot. You know, they're, they're green and white, they like to stay hidden. 
But if you spot a male doing this, you know that a female's around. After he does his little display dive, which is both an attractive to the females, hey, look how gorgeous I am, but also as a territorial warning, you know, other males, stay out of the way. Um, he'll find a female, he'll go right up to her, get right up in her face, and he'll spread his gorget out, and he'll get his wings out, and he'll go zing, 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 like an inch from her face, which is when she puts her long bill into play and says, go away, right? So uh, let me put a plug in. If anybody finds a hummingbird nest, I would really, really like to document it. I got a GoPro, and, and uh, let me know. Absolutely. Do, do both sexes incubate? Or? No, the males take off in June and say, nice knowing you. See you when you get to California, but look me up. Do they both build the nest, do you know? Or? No, females. The, the females. males will just fly the territory and they will mate with as many females as they possibly can. they build the nest? No. No. No, only the females do all the nest building, building. rearing, okay. and everything. The males just guard the territory and they will also guard their feeders and only everybody off except their females. And a lot of times you, you might have that happen when you have your feeders out, a male will get incredibly cushy and take over a feeder and keep everybody away. So just let them have that feeder and then go put another cluster of feeders over there for the girls and it'll all be better. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about hummingbird food? What yes. Um, thank you for reminding me and then I can also put in a plug for I. I uh, have some handouts if you haven't gotten, I hope I printed out enough. Uh, hummingbird food, don't buy the red expensive hummingbird syrup. It's a waste of money and there's some question as to the health of that dye. Just good clean water, uh, three to one, uh, three parts water to one cup sugar, or yeah, so I usually do uh, four cups of water and then See, now I'm getting myself confused. Yeah, one to three. One to three ratio. Yeah, that's what you, that's the, the best. But you can go one to four if you're low on sugar. One to three. No higher than one to three. Keep it clean. Do, the key is don't put anything out there you're not going to drink yourself. If it gets cloudy and nasty, take it down, clean it out. Black mold is the bane. Keep, get rid of your mold. I like to soak my feeders if they get really bad. I soak them in um, hydrogen peroxide or oxyclean and then rinse them out really well with like white vinegar and then it'll just make sure they're rinsed really well and completely dry and then just fill them back up with the, with the syrup. So um, I'm looking for banding stations to establish in Cordova. If you have season long feeders that are well established and you've got birds coming to them and you think that it might be a good place for me to come and catch some birds, please give me a call. I would love to put shiny new bracelets on their legs. I just I'm curious on the trapping process. Uh, are they easy to catch? Do you no. have a feeder and get birds using it and then you yes. trap around it? Yeah, and I have a couple of different traps and birds get very trap wise. Sure. So you have to get sneaky yeah, after the birds have been caught for a while. And I have to move locations and strategies and trap types and hide. Because they see me, and they never like the moon is catching them. <laughs> you know? I got a camo out. My son helps me. Do you have like a trap door set up that wants to envision watching my trip? Yeah, um, the trap, I, I, have, um, I have a round trap that I hang with the trap that's just outside the window. And then it's just got like a drawstring. And I run it like through the window. Sure. And then I hide behind my potted plants. Mm -hmm. And the bird comes and just, you know, drop, the, drop the trap. And then I have another trap that's like a net. It's on a hoop, and the whole net just drops down. That one works really well too. And I'm in the process of we're all all us humbanders, We all are devising new some new traps. So I'm, I'm in the process of making another one. So. <laughs> go ahead. You had your hand up. Uh, I just had a question. If we had a um, we are, we live on a boat and we go around the sound. If we had a feeder on board, would they? to it if it was moving, it, not moving at the moment, but if it was changing location? I bet they would because I know that the ferry puts a feeder on, on I think like the Tusty has had a feeder on it and the birds come to it. But you know, it's more, that would be like more of an opportunistic thing. They would see it come by and go, oh, something red, let me go check it out. Well, they come to our boat, we have red on the boat, they always yeah, come flying red. Yeah. And that's the other thing, you know, a lot of times if you have birds that are getting trapped, in your garage or your shed, it's you know, just look around and see what's orange, what's red. A friend of mine who lives in like an upstairs apartment above his shop shed, 
And so he hangs all his fishing gear on the stairs going up into his, you know, upstairs apartment. And the, the you know, the orange gloves and the buoy and the birds just like follow, <laughs> follow it up the stairs and then they're in his apartment. So you need to put this away or open your door. So that's usually what happens. Does it make any difference? Can you use brown sugar or should you use white sugar? Brown sugar has molasses in it. So yeah, I use I use pure cane white sugar. White I don't I don't want to use the GMO beet stuff. I want to use pure cane sugar. And they run me dry on sugar, so you can see on my donation list, sugar. We're gonna, yeah. They'll empty me out. You know, it's like I filled that those feeders up once today. And that's it. You can wait till morning. What are the predators on? Cats. Um, Cooper's hawks, if they can catch them. Uh, I've seen jays. I've seen jays snatch them, especially the immatures. That was real surprising the first time I saw that. A jay came and snatched an immature right off the feeder. That was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, but I think a lot of the mortality is is both is just stress. You know, the cost of, of, of getting your groceries and trying to survive the weather. You know, once they once they're flying. They are fast. Um, there is an EAC legend, actually it's, it's, a, it's an elliptic legend, that say um, the hummingbirds come up on, on the backs of geese. And they do arrive about the same time in the spring, but, but, the, but they leave a lot earlier. The geese stay longer. But you know, I know geese. Geese have really bad tempers. <laughs> I don't think pro that they would, they would tolerate a hummingbird on them. But also, hummingbirds are very fast flyers. And geese are slow flyers. Now those hummingbirds get on, they get up there on that air current and they go. I mean, they made it, that bird made it from Trinidad all the way to Texas in 45 days or less. That's a long way for a little bird that weighs less than four ounces. Pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Do they have a species of tree that they prefer to build their nest on? We don't know. Um, I'm guessing that they really like the spruce trees because it's it's very protective. You know, those needles are sharp and they're thick, and they can get down in you know up. I think they're nesting on the steep slopes, you know, on the tops of these spruce trees. But I haven't found one. I don't know. Uh, they also nest in the salmonberry bushes. I've heard a lot of um, a lot of local knowledge about nests being found in salmonberry bushes as well. Um, so they like they like that protective cover. Usually, usually two, three at the most, but only two are going to make it. It would be incredibly unusual for three to make it out of the nest. The nest would be about the size of a quarter. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. And I never found one. I would love to find one. Any records of the offshore in the Gulf of Alaska? Just that, um, you know, Dave could probably, but I. You haven't had any visit your boat. Um, I'm not sure. Not far offshore. Yeah, Scott, have you guys been out on boats out there? And, and no, seen? No, no, no. Yeah, but you know that that one picture of those babies. They were they were 75 miles offshore out there off of the coast of Canada, you know, Vancouver Island. The so. migration route's likely just a land hopping all the way around. Yeah. yeah. Rolling across the sea. Yeah. But you know they're showing up at weird times and weird places. There was a rufus in Pennsylvania in January. Uh, why we don't know. Well, I've heard the ruby threaded you know, across the Gulf of uh, Mexico mm -hmm. direct flight, so that's a long. Yes. But they're bigger birds. And they're slightly bigger, but yeah, mm -hmm. all, most of. And they use some amazing percentage of the body weight. Yeah, there's like uh, over 300 species of hummingbirds uh, in, the, in the Americas. Of those, 17 come to the United States. Of those, only two are reported in Alaska, but I think we've got three now because. Uh, did you see those reports from um, Mr. White Keys in Anchorage of that suspected Costas? That we was had there. Costa here. Okay, Costa. Was that about okay, 10 Costa years ago? That's another one. There's another scientific paper for me right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a few years. It's actually during the winter, right? Right, yeah. yeah. It's got to be 10 or 15 years ago. So, yeah, so um, hopefully I'll be doing some groundbreaking research here. Um, hopefully I'll be presenting at the Shorebird Festival this spring again. Uh, and I've also been invited to present at the S Sedona Hummingbird Festival this year, which is down in Sedona, Arizona. Uh, and that's at the end of July. 
and if any of you guys you know travel that part of the world in the in the summer, it's a great festival and Sedona is gorgeous. Just get them there. Yeah. Do through the hot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like, why am I in Sedona in August? Why? Oh yeah. Okay. To dry out. Yeah, and to get my hands on a couple of different species of hummingbirds, I don't get to get up up here. So. Yeah. Claire and Oliver's up on the studio last week. I encountered some bush willows in bloom, so the south-facing slopes might be the willows might be popping here. Yes. I sure felt that way this week. Didn't I? Yeah, they're predicting that even though El Nino is breaking up, we're going to have another early spring just like last year. So hopefully it'll be a good bird year again this, this year. Looking forward to catching up. Did you find how many birds hit my window? I think from the reflection. Yeah. Is there a way to keep them from doing that? Yeah, um, anything to break up the reflection of the window. Um, and you can also know what time of day and, and season that you know, changes as the sun moves. Um, but you can get, Audubon has some really great little sticker, window, really pretty little window stickers. I got some at Alaska Mill and Feed um, that are really nice that you can just put on, on your window and that breaks up the reflection. And, yeah, they were flying, like trying to fly right through from one end of my house to the other because it looked like clear sky, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a yeah, that could have been the reflection. They can't see. Another house that windows like that, and all the birds that hit the concussions. Yeah, windows take out a lot of birds. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you could you could put up um, falcon silhouettes, where, especially on those big plate glass windows. Those work really well because that's a predator. And you're like, ah, oh, get away from that. Um, another reason that a bird might be like a lot of times this happens on car mirrors or you know, a little bedroom window or something. In the spring, the males see their reflection and they start fighting themselves. That can be very annoying at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So uh, I think I've covered all the bases. Um, so yes, questions? I'm looking for a place to band hummingbirds. I'm also looking for a place to live this summer too. So anybody has a place to rent. I'm very, I'm very quiet and clean. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Okay, well, thank you for coming tonight, and I hope we see March 15th for James' talk on Mongolia. <laughs>